It is a curious thing to observe, to behold, if you will, uh, family units and how they mimic each other in their mannerisms. And um, think, for instance, how sometimes a wife and husband, they can finish each other's sentences. Or um, the, the kids, uh, their offspring sometimes will look just like them in different ways. Sometimes it's even in the way they perceive things or the nuances of the way they say things. Um, sometimes it's even in the way they just gesture. And, it, and it's not like they're trying. It's just like... That's, the mannerisms of the family, they emulate each other because they've been around each other so much that oftentimes you've heard it say, oh, you're just like your mom, or you're, you're your father's son. And so I noticed this lately as, as uh, kids getting their licenses now, and I'm trying to get into the family vehicle, and, and you know what's common. I try to squeeze into the chair, and I've got to, like, you know, back it up because they're they're mother's daughter. They're so close to the steering wheel, right? Or, or Trey and I, we, we've been doing a little go-karting on the side, and um, I stepped out of a round um, a couple weeks back, and I watched him make the circuit, and I'm like, oh my goodness, he is way too much like me, cutting people off and spinning people around. And, but they, they emulate us, and it's just, it's not like they're trying. It's just give that example in front of them and in relationship, little nuances, just little things. They begin to pick up the mannerisms within the family systems. We, uh, I don't encourage you to do this, but speaking of driver's ed, oftentimes they will encourage you to get into a parking lot, a wide open parking lot, and to practice with your kids there. I, I didn't take that suggestion with both of my first two kids. We go to the cemetery. I know you're thinking that's kind of crazy. It is, but stay with me for a second. I like to take him to the cemetery because there are these little straight and narrow paths. There's all these obstacles, and they need to be aware of these obstacles and their blind spots and where they're going. But ultimately, their goal when they know this is to exit the cemetery, to get out there and enjoy the freedoms of their license of driving. And so last week, if you were with us, we talked about some of those obstacles that are kind of in our rearview mirror, our side mirrors, and we call them idols. And we're in a longer series called Behold Your God, Big G, but last week we looked at our blind spots at Behold Your Gods, those little idols. But we unwrapped that message just to give you a peripheral vision, because the object isn't to obsess and be totally interested in and be preoccupied by those other gods, rather just to be aware of them so that you can really behold your God, the freedom, the license that God has given us out there. And we, we tend to be preoccupied with what we're preoccupied with. We obsess over our obsessions, and so sharing a message like last week, it's like, don't think about cookies. You're all thinking about cookies right now, right? And so because we have that, I just want to get those in our periphery to put them behind us because ultimately is to accelerate and to really behold our God. We're going to look at some passages that we looked at last week. Isaiah, you can turn there if you want. Isaiah 46 is where we're going to start. And so in trying to behold our God, big G, is to remember in the periphery those blind spots of those other gods that are vying for our attention to be aware of them. But in the context of being aware of them, Isaiah 44, we talked about how those idols make themselves known, especially in the Old Testament here. All who fashion idols are nothing. They're made by the ironsmith, the carpenter takes in. The, the foolish thing is, is that they take the same piece of wood and they would make a fire out of it and warm themselves and give light. And then they would take the other part of that wood and they would make an idol out of it. And it's foolish. And so in context of that, the opposite of that, the antithesis of the idol, is to behold our God, big G. Verse 6 of 44 says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I'm the first, I'm the last, and beside me there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim it, let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. No one's ever able to do that. Only God can say what's going to come in the future. And he says, fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. There is a God. Is there a God beside me? 
there is no rock, I know not any. Who is like me? There is no God beside me. This theme continues on. Go to chapter 46 or listen with me. And it's like there. Uh, go ahead, try to compare. And chapter 46 does that. He throws a couple of the big gods, Bel and Nebo, out there. And just look at these gods, even to be able to craft them. And they, and they have to put them on the beast of burden to get them from point A to point B because they can't move on their own. They're idols. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but they themselves go into captivity. And how are they made? Verse 6, those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver and scales. They hire a goldsmith and makes it into a god. And they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in a place like a shrine. And it stands there. It cannot move from its place. And if one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. They can't rescue these other gods that we like to look to, that we are beholding. They can't rescue us. Only the one true God can do that. There's, there's really no comparison when we try to compare. In fact, I gave you a, a riddle last week. Some of you were not, are not happy with me because I didn't give the answer to the riddle. I've been getting texts all week of some answer. The riddle was this. We see them all the time. We see them all the time, and kings seldom see them. And God never sees them. We see them all the time. And kings, they seldom see them. But God never sees them. Who is like this God? Well, there's a, a little bit of recollection of who he is in chapter 4. Even in your old age, I am he and the gray hairs. I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and I will save. Only the one true God can move and has breath and can save, can rescue. Verse 9, remember the former things of old. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet done, saving my counsel. My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. I'll do whatever I please. There's no, there's no God like this. And so we, we see them all the time. Kings seldom see them, and God never sees them. What is that? Verse 5, to whom will you liken me and make me an equal? We see them all the time. We see our equals. We see people that are greater than us. And rarely, but oftentimes, kings and presidents and czars and people of great authority, uh, they, they are raised, raised up and they come low. They see them sometimes, but God never, God never sees an equal. There is no one like him. No one that even compares. There's no contest. So as we are beholding your God, remember that, because oftentimes we filter it through something that we think he's like. But he's not. He's so far above that. And so as we are beholding him, keep that in mind that there is no one equal to. There's no contest. There's really not even a comparison. Stack me up against the biggest and the baddest gods, and there is no equal, no contest. No comparison. And so as we behold in him, he, he awakens our senses because we've been desensitized by other idols, other things around us. But once we really turn and realize that those other things are small, if nothing, he awakens our senses so that we can see and hear and really start to comprehend who he is. He awakens our senses to an ever-increasing preoccupation of beholding him. It's the cycle. Once we see him, we get hungry for him, and we want more, and we want to behold him. It works in tandem. God works in tandem with our senses in his spirit. His spirit, it stirs in us to behold him. His spirit testifies with our spirit, and there's this internal and external experience and relationship that we have with God and his spirit revealing and of taking the veil off our senses and is simultaneously confirming the trustworthiness and the praiseworthiness of our Lord, of God. It, and you know this, when you have an aha moment, you can't help but to express that somehow. Either in your, in your countenance, in your face, or even by saying something, you've got to look at this. And so when we are beholding God, when we are truly beholding God, we can't help it but to praise Him. Now that doesn't mean we bust out in a musical, though some of you might like that. I like a good whistle every once in a while. But we're talking about what does that praise really look like? 
that authentic praise. It's automated. It's not even like we're trying. It's just like we're so overwhelmed by who he is, we can't help but to praise him. Turn back a couple chapters to chapter 42, and we start to get an idea of who we are beholding now. Chapter 42, who we are beholding your God, big G. Verse 5 of 42 says, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, and who gives breath to its people on it, and spirit to those who walk. Did you see the sequence? He, he's the creator of the heavens. And then he crafted this earth, this world that we live in, this unique planet that sustains life. And on it he gave people who have the very image of God himself stamped on it. And the very breath of God breathed in it. There's no other God like that. There's no, there's no equal. There's no comparison. Verse 8, I am the Lord. That's my name, my glory. I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. He said, I'm not going to share that with anybody else. I'm the only one that's trustworthy and praiseworthy is the God, the creator of all. And catch this. Like I said, it, it, it turns in us. that It's like it's an automated. We can't help but to praise. And you see that. Verse 10. Sing praise to the Lord, a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You go down to the sea and all that fills it, and the coastlands and their inhabitants, and the desert and its cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains, let them give glory to the Lord. From the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, it stimulates praise in us. I'm going to look at some of that praise. I'm going to turn to Psalms 115, 118, 135, and I want you to see a, a triad that's in all three of these Psalms. We're going to start at 118, Psalms 118, and I just want to lift out of the Scripture this triad, and I think it will make sense as we go a little farther. So 118, Psalms 118, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let all those who fear him say his steadfast love endures forever. Now, what that, that's cute. It's a poem. But what that's saying is that's God's people. That's God's leaders. And that's their influence. Do you see that? We'll see it again here. Turn to 135, Psalms 135. You'll see that same triad again surface to the top. I'll back up a little bit because there's some other significant pieces in here. Psalms 135 verse 5, for I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods, above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven, on earth, and the seas, and all the depths below. Do you see these themes that keep reoccurring? The creator God, as we behold him, from the heavens above to the earth below to the seas to the depths. Verse 13, your name, O Lord, endures forever, and your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. And then you're familiar with this one from last week. 15, the idols of the nation are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but can't speak, eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them, and so do those who trust in them. You come just like them, and so do those who trust in them. And then here's the triad I want you to see. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. Those are the leaders again. That's the people, and it's the leaders. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. That sphere of influence. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now, a blessing here is the idea of uh, almost being knighted. You know, you kneel down. There's an idea of being kneel, kneeling down. It's both giving the blessing and receiving the blessing. God is giving us a blessing. He's honoring us. And we are honoring Him by receiving the blessing. And the word praise here is kind of that overwhelmed senses of, I can't help but just say it or show it. That's the praise that's talked about here. Psalms 115 this is where we're going to settle for a little bit in Psalms 115. And I want you to just keep seeing those reoccurring themes as they surface. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name we give glory. Because of your unfailing love, 
and your faithfulness, why should the nation say, where is their God? Well, our God's in heaven. He does all that pleases him, right? Whatever he says he's going to do, he's going to accomplish it. And there's no other God, there's no other equal that can do that. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths to speak, but they cannot speak. They have eyes to see, but they can't see. They can't hear. They can't smell. They can't touch and feel. They can't walk and move. These idols can't do that. They, they, can, they can utter nothing or no breath can come out of their voice. And those who make them will become just like them. And so will all who trust in them. You become like them, desensitized. But this is where we want to go this week is the trust. O oh, Israel, we see the triad. O oh, Israel, my people, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. Oh, my leaders, oh, oh, Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. And all those who trust him, trust, trust in the Lord, those who fear him, he's your help and your shield. So my people and those who lead them and, and your sphere of influence, trust in the Lord. The Lord has remembered us and he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless all of those who fear him. So trust in him, so be blessed by him and bless him, both small and great. And may the Lord give you increase, you and your children. It's that whole idea of not only you, but may it be mimicked. May the same mannerisms that uh, trusting and blessing in you be mimicked and become the mannerisms of your own family. You and your children, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. He keeps drawing us back to this creation, who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead, they, they don't praise the Lord, they don't boast about the Lord, nor do any who go down in silence. But it is we, it's we who bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, praise the Lord. So you see, the trusting, the blessing, it automatically should draw in us it's like this. God has entrusted us, and it's cyclical. God has in, entrusted his very reputation on us. That blows me away. I can't believe the God of the universe, Jesus, entrusts his reputation to us. But he does that. He's, he's entrusted. And so, therefore, he's calling us to trust him. We trust him, and then we give away our trust as well. We are blessed by him, and so we bless him, and we give away our blessing as well. We are loved by him and so, therefore, we love him, and we give away our love as well. And we can't help it in the midst of all of this, all of the love, all of the blessing. We can't help it but to be overwhelmed and praise him and praise him. That's what it looks like there. It's a curious thing how we emulate and mimic and take on the same patterns, the very mannerisms of those that we hang out with, or those we are spending time with, and we all do it. We're all trusting. We're all blessing. We are all loving, and we're all praising something and someone. The question is, how much are you trusting and blessing and loving and praising what's in your rearview mirror, what's in your blind spots? Have you ever done this on a bicycle or a car? You got so distracted with something that as you looked at it too long, you begin to veer towards it, right? That's what, that's what the warning is. That's, that's what the warning is as we Look at this. And what are we emulating? Who are we? I'd love to spend the time this morning of, of just taking each of us to the throne, of just truly beholding God. And Isaiah did this early on. He's just like, man, I saw God on the throne and the train of his robe. It filled the temple. All of these word pictures are just amazing. And the book of Daniel, he, God gives him the calendar. And it's just like, wow, we can just be in awe of God's plan, his program, and how he's going to lay it all out. The book of Ezekiel, it's like the new heavens and the new earth, as if the old heavens and old earth isn't enough for our senses to be overwhelmed with. Ezekiel's like, boom, look at the new creation that's going to happen. One of my favorite descriptions of really beholding God is, is in the book of Job. And Job's friend, Eliehu, gives this a biographical sketch of who God is through creation. And then the last couple chapters, God steps in and says, let me give you my autobiography here. And he gives all of these creations and just beautiful to behold, to sense God, to see, to hear, to be overwhelmed by who God is. Or we can have a first-person encounter and we can talk through Adam and Eve walking with God. And they walked with God in the garden. Come on. Who does that? Adam and Eve. <laughs> That's it. And, but they beheld him in all of his glory there. 
Moses got a little, a, a little viewing of God. He really wanted to see God and all he was. And God kind of put him back in the crevice of a mountain. And God walked by him. And Moses was able to look upon, to behold the glory of God. And it changed Moses. It changed him so much. He was so overwhelmed with praise that he had to put a veil over his face so he didn't freak people out when he came back. To behold God and all of these scenarios and scriptures of where they're really beholding. Uh, Paul, he describes a man that was caught up into paradise and what he saw, he was unable to speak it. Peter describes, describes seeing Jesus and his transfiguration here on earth. And he witnessed Elijah and Moses having this conversation with Jesus. And, and he says, we were eyewitnesses, we beheld his majesty. Not only majesty as in king, but his splendor. To behold our God is to be overwhelmed with who he is. And in that, when, when Peter saw that, and not only did he see it, but he heard this booming voice say, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. It's like God was saying, I'm proud of him. This is, my boy's doing exactly what I told him to do. And Jesus said, I only do that which my father tells me to do. And I'm thinking, Peter, if he's looking onto this, he's like, Oh, he's his father's son. He's his father's son. He's mimicking. He's emulating. He's got the same mannerisms of God the Father. What a, what a beautiful picture. And I could take you to all those in John in the book of the Revelations of Jesus. And he gives this expansive, expansive view of, of the throne room and just to be wowed by it. But instead of going to all of those, I want to take you to the creation of heaven and earth. And the creation of earth. And the, and the u most unique creation on earth was you, was me. And to be overwhelmed in our senses by even looking at our senses to say, oh my goodness, there is no equal, there is no one like our God. Even when we look at ourselves, who the very image of God was stamped on us, on us. And think about Jesus before we even look at ourselves. The one true God that relates to us, he's personified through Jesus, made real to us through his spirit in tandem with our spirit. And Jesus, he has a mouth that speaks. He's not like these other idols. He has eyes and ears that see and hear and a, no and a nose that can take in the aroma that has taste buds that delight in. He has a hand that reaches and feet that run, this Jesus does, and a throat that breathes and others utters sound and blessing he was not fashioned by man and more precious than gold and those that are created by him catch this those that are created by him become just like him and those that are trust him become just like him not by trying but because we emulate those that we hang out with those that we spend time with it's 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 kind of a curious thing it's a fascinating thought is so if we become like that which we idolize what if what if the parallel principle is true what if the thing we begin to idolize is God what if, what if God really is the God in our lives then that which is desensitized that becomes awake again and our senses start to see and hear and delight in the same things that Jesus does so let's do it. Let's go through the grid of 115, flipping it upside down. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. I am not the work of silver and gold. I'm made out of clay like Adam was. I have the very breath of God in me. That's a crazy thought. They have mouths, but don't speak. These I have a mouth, and I can speak. And Peter says if we speak, we should speak as though we're speaking the very words of God himself. And if we serve, we should do so in the strength that God gives us. So that in all things, God gets the glory through Jesus. So what do we speak? And is it emulating the one that we are spending time with? And he has given us eyes to see. Now we're no longer desensitized, but now we can really see the things that God's about. And we can really hear and start to tune in on kingdom things, things that God is stoked about that Jesus wants to accomplish in our lives. And we begin to smell and get the aroma and, our, and the taste and delight in the same things that Jesus delights in. And, and he's given us a hand to, to feel, to sympathize, to empathize with other people, that we are to be the hands and the feet. Blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. He, he gives us the ability to be mobile, 
in his name. He's given us breath and utterances from our throat that we can speak life and grace and favor and mercy into people's lives. We'll become exactly what we trust in. We become just like him if we allow ourselves to fixate our eyes on him. Not on the periphery, not on these other gods, but if we would get interested in, be preoccupied with, and even obsess over this God, we'll become just like him. He allows, and it's not trying, I'm not trying to do that, it's just we become like that which we become family with. Have you ever seen or witnessed a person, either on the news or YouTube, or when either the first time or they got it restored to them, their sight or their hearing? And so you can Google this sometimes, but it's, it's a sight to behold when, when people for the first time or once again can see or can hear 30 million plus views of Sarah Sherman. Sarah Sherman, she's got a hearing implant. And for the first time, when the nurse slash technician asked her these questions, she could hear for the first time. They asked, technically, your device is on. Can you tell? And Sarah lost it. She puts her hands to her mouth, and she could hear for the first time. And not only could she hear, the first thing she said, not only can I hear, but I can hear my own voice. She never heard her own voice. For the first time, when your senses come alive to really beholding God, it's like that. Noel Stafford, first time in 66 years, he, he received a special pair of glasses. He had opened them up, and his family had put all these balloons, different colored balloons, beside of him. And he put the glasses on, not knowing really what it was, and he put his glasses on. He couldn't leave them on. He put them on and take them off, and he was just emotionally spent. It's the first time he saw a collar in 66 years. And don't think he wasn't thankful and praising. It was automated. There's something in him that, that made him do that. A California couple had a little infant child. Not that she was colicky, but they had already done the check the dirty diaper, made sure she was fed, and she was just crying uncontrollably. And they, they thought of this idea, how do, we, how do we get this baby to quit crying? So dad grabs a chocolate cookie, puts it under this infant baby nose that had never smelt chocolate before. Sensory overload, the baby's eyes go wide, the crying stops, and the body shakes. Some of you do that when you get chocolate too, right? <laughs> but you get my point, right? It's like, wow, wow, I'm really beholding now at this, at this time. Some of you have gotten laryngitis or lost your voice before, and you regain your voice. Sometimes you, you get some, a sty in your eye, and you finally get that thing out of there. You get water in your ear, and finally you can hear again. Your hands or your legs have fallen asleep and they wake up again. Or you've got the wind knocked out of you and finally you can breathe again. Oh, it stirs in us. There's this automated praise that comes forth. Again, it's not like we bust into musical in that, but everything in us says thank you. I get it. I'm beholding now. So to summarize, as we behold God, it becomes self-evident that we become more like him. One degree of glory to the next, 2 Corinthians 3. Be aware of your blind spots, those idols in your rear view side mirrors. And remember, sometimes those objects, those idols, are maybe a little closer than they appear. So be aware of that. But don't get fixated on that. Rather, fix your eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of your faith. Set your mind on things above, that which is noble, pure, lovely, admirable. If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about those things. That's your freedom. That's your license. Not stuck back here with these little gods. There's no equal. There's no contest. There's no comparison when you really behold your God. Because he will awaken your senses to an ever-increasing preoccupation of beholding him. And the invitation is to trust the invitation is to understand that he's trusting us, and he wants us to be trusting. He, he has blessed us, and he wants us to be a blessing. He's loved us and wants us to be loving. And he has praised us, and he wants us to be praising. To emulate, to mimic, to say, I want to be like, is there any greater praise? They say, they say the sincerest form of flattery is this. Just these basic mannerisms. So lastly, Peter 
and John, the worship team can come up. I just want to share this illustration. I thought about that this week. Peter and John had just performed a miracle, and it was after Jesus had ascended into heaven. It was one of the first miracles, and they came to this lame man who'd been lame since birth, and they came up to him and said, silver and gold, catch that, silver and gold we don't have for you, but what we do have for you, we give to you freely in the name of Jesus, no other name, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Guess they were, they were incarcerated for that. <laughs> and so the next day, they're standing before their accusers, and they say, salvation has come, and it comes by no other name but by the name of Jesus. And their accusers said this, these men are unschooled men. They're just a bunch of ordinary guys. But I can tell that they've been with Jesus. Their mannerisms were exactly that of Jesus. They emulated Christ. And it's almost, I could say, from, from a distance even. It's like, it's like they were their father's son. And that's the question we go to as, as we pray today. Can, do people see that in our lives? Do they see us beholding God? Because in the beholding, everything else takes care of itself evangelism, sharing Jesus with people. If you are beholding God, you can't help it but to share what's going on, what you see, what you perceive God doing in and around you by seeing creation from God's lens, from His perspective. And can people look into your life and say, ah, that's the Father's daughter. That's the Father's son. God, we pray that over us today, that, that you would... Um, so get our attention that all these other trivial idols that we sometimes bow the knee to would just fade. That they would fade away because we would be so fixated in beholding you, understanding that you've trusted us, understanding that you've blessed us, understanding that you've loved us, understanding that you've even praised us. And God, all we want to do is just reciprocate that, just give it back. And may we catch that, not even taught, but maybe it just be caught. That as we hang out with you and understand your truths of Scripture, God, may it be evident in the things that we see and hear and the places that we go and people's lives that we speak into. Uh, Jesus, only you can do this. Your spirit in tandem with ours is the only way this hope works as we behold you. Thank you, Jesus, for beholding us. In your name, amen.